Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the INSEAD Digital Initiative uh, Tech Talk series. My name is Pavel Kiryev and I'm a faculty member at INSEAD where I teach classes in the MBA program on artificial intelligence, uh, some courses in the PhD program on machine learning and also do research on how we can use data in digital marketplaces and platforms. And today the topic of the talk is algorithms under attack. I'll be joined by a, a very interesting company called Robust Intelligence. Uh, the two founders of the company, Kojin Oshiba and Yaron Singer. And we'll be talking about uh, some interesting aspects of how uh, companies can protect their machine learning algorithms uh, or make sure that machine learning algorithms actually do what they're supposed to and perform well in practice. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, Georgina Hall, who is like myself, a faculty member at INSEAD, uh, who does research on optimization and different applications to machine learning and also teaches uh, courses that are related um, to the decision sciences, uh, data analysis, and so on. So I'm looking forward to having a, a very interesting discussion altogether. And this Tech Talk series is in partnership with uh, Accenture Strategy. But to start, I'd like to first kick us off with a poll question to get a sense of how the audience is thinking about um, applications of machine learning, applications of data analytics, how are you thinking about this in, in the context of your organizations? So for this poll, please let us know, uh, when you think about benefits or the risks of machine learning, which of these is more important to you at this point? So I'll give you a moment to answer, and then we'll see the results uh, that pop up on the screen afterwards. Okay, so here we have our first results, which are already incredibly interesting. 82% said that the benefits of machine learning are what they're most important, what is most important to them right now, and only 18% are thinking about the risks. So let's keep that number in mind, and we'll come back to that, come back to that later. So next, let me explain a little bit, uh, give a brief intro into the recent trends in artificial intelligence. Uh, so this, these are, I'm using this graph to describe and kind of give context as to what the AI machine learning industry uh, may look like in the recent years, how it has evolved over the past few years. Um, so I'm not referencing here the old, uh, you know, stuff that has been going on in this field for many, many decades, but only the recent decade. And to do this, I often show this, this graphic at the start of, of different courses that I teach, uh, because I think it tells us a little bit about where, where we started and where we are currently um, in this machine learning industry. On the x-axis here, you have the date. So it ranges from 2009 to uh, about present day. And on the y-axis, we have the search interest into different terms, different keywords, buzzwords, uh, words that tend to come up quite a bit when people are thinking about data analysis or thinking about machine learning and so on. Um, and this shows us some very interesting and telling trends. So we see that prior to uh, 2010 or so, there was somewhat limited, uh, relatively limited uh, interest in these topics. But in the recent years, it really started to boom and increase in interest based on these, on these search trends. And the whole thing started with this growing interest in the term big data, which was largely driven by the fact that companies with increased digitization were starting to realize that they now have large data sets that they can analyze and that they can work with in some ways. But at this point, people were thinking, how can we actually organize these data? How can we do simple things with the data? How can we make sure that we can use this data um, in the best way possible? Now, more recently, we've seen this boom in interest in terms like machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence, which I interpret as referring to finding ways of actually gaining more value from this big data by applying more sophisticated algorithms to it, by designing more sophisticated systems that can make intelligent decisions based on this data that we've now organized and, and sort of figured out how to, how to, how to um, be able to use it in the best way. And the question is, and what we'll be talking a lot about in, in this uh, webinar is what is coming next? So we see that these trends are still increasing. You know, people are still quite interested in things like machine learning, AI. These are things that are still very popular, but what is really the next phase? After companies start to deploy these algorithms, start to deploy these systems, where are we going? And one thing that I will argue is that actually caring a bit more about the risks and caring more about ways in which we can mitigate and manage some of the issues that come up might actually be a very important next phase in this evolution. 
So with that, I'd like to pass it over and introduce uh, my colleague, Georgina Hall, who will now tell us a little bit about the research um, in this area. In machine learning and the AI industry, research is always going in parallel with what's happening in business. So Georgina will tell us a bit about how those trends are also coinciding with some of these trends um, from the practical side. Please go, take, go ahead, Georgina. Thanks very much, Pavel. So uh, following up on what Pavel said, um, so uh, there are some current research trends in ML and a lot of them are actually focused, as Pavel was mentioning, on the risks and the downsides of machine learning. So I'm gonna give you three different uh, research trends, so current research trends uh, along those lines. So the first such research trend is about making machine learning more interpretable. So the questions in this area are typically, you know, what does it even mean for an algorithm to be interpretable? If we have many different competing notions of interpretability, um, how do we rank them? How do we evaluate which ones are, are the best? Um, and you know, within these different notions, are there some of them that can be monitored by regulators? So this is a, becoming a more and more desirable property. There's also a question of trade-offs um, between different concepts, right? So between say interpretability and accuracy. So if I have a predictor that gives me different predictions, then typically if I require that these predictions be also interpretable, I'm actually constraining my predictor in some sense. So typically what I would expect is for the accuracy to go down. So as the accuracy goes down, my interpretability may go up. And so there are similar trade-offs as well going on between say fairness and accuracy and fairness and interpretability. So that's the first research direction um, that's, that's of interest within the space of you know, machine learning downsides. A second uh, research direction of interest is about theoretical guarantees for machine learning algorithms. And the conversation we're gonna to have today is gonna to focus mostly on this um, second direction. So the reason why this has become important in the machine learning community is because suddenly we're deploying these machine learning algorithms um, to areas where suddenly good performance on average is not gonna be enough. So think about healthcare, for example, right? Or think about you know unmanned flight, delivery drones. Um, in these setups, you want to know what performance in the worst case looks like. Um, so that's one direction. You can also ask about different characteristics of your model, right? So for example, does your model divulge private information about some individuals that you have? Can you guarantee that that is not the case? Or is your model uh, vulnerable to adversarial attacks? So this last, last question is gonna be pretty much the focus of our conversation uh, in the next hour. And then we have a third direction, which is maybe closer to my own research, which is about making machine learning algorithms more efficient. And a topic that kind of goes hand in hand with that, which is about scaling up machine learning algorithms. So the idea here is that if you make your machine learning more efficient, a machine learning algorithm more efficient, then you're able to use whatever efficiency you've gained to apply it to a larger data set. So the reason people want to make these machine learning algorithms more efficient is linked in part, I like to think, uh, to the fact that there are huge environmental costs linked to machine learning um, amongst other things, you know, due to server calling and computation. So there are two directions in this area of making machine learning algorithms more efficient. There's one direction which involves taking algorithms that have been around for some time and basically trying to streamline them in some sense, or maybe make them distributed across many machines to make it more efficient. There's also another research direction here, which is about uh, developing new algorithms. And typically these new algorithms, what they seek to do is um, they have some kind of trade-off between accuracy and efficiency going on. So typically they will give you say predictions in two hours instead of six hours, but these predictions will be less accurate. So these are three directions that I think are super exciting uh, moving forward and relate to what we've been, what we're gonna be talking about today. So in the line of this, uh, we're gonna be doing a second poll uh, so this second poll asks you about what kind of algorithm risks you are most concerned about. So we've divided it here into five different categories, bad data and performance, deep fakes, discrimination, loss of privacy, and high upfront costs.
So I'm going to let Pavel take this one. Excellent. So I'll jump back in. And here it seems like if we ask you to think specifically about risks, um, then bad data and performance appears to be the one that, that comes up as the most relevant. So let's keep these questions in mind. Um, now I'm very happy to introduce uh, Kojin and Yuran. Um, and we'll shift over to the conversation to now start, start talking to them a bit about what their company is doing. Um, so Kojin, Yuran, please feel free to, to, to train. Yes, good to see you. Um, so first question is, so we're looking at these results from the audience. The very first question we asked benefits versus risks. Overwhelmingly, people were talking about benefits. You know, conditional on thinking about risks, we then have some distribution. So what is your reaction um, to these results? I'll start with Yaron. Uh, what do you think about this and how does this really connect to what your company is doing? Are the perceptions of the audience correct with what's really going on in the industry? Um, so I, I think that the answer is, um, it is, it's a complex answer, right? Um, but, but definitely I think the perceptions of the audience is spot on. I think that like, um, you know, um, uh, what, what, what we're seeing the trends in industries, we're seeing that there's um, that, uh, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that there's just massive adoption of machine learning, uh, machine learning technologies out there, right? So what that, obviously what that tells us is it tells us that organizations are, you know, are coming to realize um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the immense value that they have in their data and their ability to um, kind of like make you know good uses of that data, right? Using kind of like a, you know smart techniques, and and you know like um, one of the things that we do kind of uh, you know as a, as a company is I think that we uh, we probably talk to on the order of like I'd say like ten to twenty new companies like every you know like uh, every week, right? So we literally cover you know sort of like we have this kind of um, where you know the, the you know one of the one of the kind of like the, the great joys of I guess uh, doing a startup like this is that you really get get a snapshot of uh, kind of uh, you know of, of the the state of machine learning right in industry right at at kind of like at the scale and and you do, and you talk deeply to uh, data science managers and VPs of data science and you really get a sense of uh, kind of where where things are and um, and we're seeing both things we're seeing the reason that we're having these conversations with all these companies is because. Well, number one, they're building their you know machine learning and AI infrastructures, right? Uh, they are they have massive amounts of data, and um, and they're seeing the benefits of it. You know, all not only the you know not only the, the VPs of data science, but you know uh, the organization as a whole, right? Um, kind of sees the value of it. Um, at the same time, the reason that these companies are talking to us is because um, they realize the risks, right? Uh, you know, the, the immense risks. Associated with, uh, with with all this data, uh, and, and and kind of and, and are deeply concerned about you know how to build infrastructure uh, that you know that, that knows how to do this in a trustworthy way, right? So I think I think that uh, I think that at both ends of the pole, I think uh, kind of have it right. Got it. Well, that's very interesting, um, and I feel like we should also step back and give you a chance to to introduce a bit more about your company and tell the audience. Uh, what you're focused on on exactly. Um, so Kojin and I, we know each other from a prior uh, prior startup. So it's very nice to see that with your with your next startup is now moving really fast. Uh, you recently secured this funding round from Sequoia Ventures, uh, which is one of the most famous uh, venture capital firms in the world. Um, they've invested in companies like Apple um, and other other many you know iconic companies that are doing extremely well right now. Um, so why don't I, I shift over to Kojin and just ask you to tell me a little bit about the sort of founding of the company and how you came to know your own and, uh, you know, tell us a bit more about, you know, specifically what, what is your company doing? What is your value proposition for your clients? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm Kojin and I'm a co-founder here at Robust Intelligence and I'll start with the founding story. So Yaron and I were both at Harvard. Uh, about two years ago. And when we were at Harvard, uh, Yaron was a professor and I was his student. And I met him through a class and, and we were doing a research together on this field called robust machine learning, uh, which is a field that studies how machine learning systems can be vulnerable, uh, how can we identify those risks and how can we mitigate those risks. And that was the domain that we were in. Uh, we wrote a couple of papers together and as we were writing this paper together, we kind of realized this huge gap 
between what we thought was really important about how vulnerable these machine learning systems are and the industry practices that people were following. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, when people are deploying machine learning systems in production, uh, people look at, uh, say, a single number, like test accuracy, which reduces the entire model behavior uh, to a single number, which is, um, if you think about deploying software system, it's a bit crazy to imagine, right? Like you look at one number, which is 90%, and you're like, oh, it's good to go, which is um, a bit crazy for software, but that's happening for machine learning. And we thought that um, there's uh, the domain of making sure that uh, your AI is ready to go in production is underdeveloped. Um, and that's where we saw a link between what we were specializing in and what the industry needed. Um, and so we decided to turn uh, part of our core technology uh, and merge that with the feedback that we got from some of our early customers. And we turned this into a product which is a platform that uh, tests and secures machine learning, uh, machine learning pipelines. And at a high level, what we do is we uh, develop what we call an AI firewall, which is a, a layer of security that sits in front of a uh, company's machine learning models. And it protects machine learning models against incoming data. Uh, there are a lot of causes uh, for incoming data to be corrupted, so there are things like broken data pipelines, shift in distribution, adversarial inputs. Sometimes the data scientists at your company can introduce bugs uh, to, to introduce these uh, data corruption. And the role of our AI firewall is to prevent and, and also catch exactly these issues from happening. Um, and right now, basically we're working with uh, a lot of technology companies uh, in various domains like finance, e-commerce, insurance, uh, some government agencies uh, to make sure that their AI systems are robust. Got it. So just uh, following up on that, how do you then feel about the reaction of the audience at the beginning? You know, thinking about benefits versus risks, most people thought about benefits. We have been somewhat framing your company as a company that focuses on the risks, but is that, is that framing entirely correct? Um, so how, how do you feel about this, uh, this first result? Yeah, so um, first of all, that is correct. We're, we're more focused on the risks. Um, and I think there's a, a, a nuanced difference between what is important and what is, and what is exciting. And I think, <clears throat> is risks exciting? No, it, it's not, right? Like people are excited about AI because AI brings a ton of benefit. But is it important? Yes, it is. And I think when people think about AI, like they're often, you know, they jump to the, the benefits without considering its risks. And people are starting to be aware of these risks, but, you know, like as a company, as an initiative, those are often uh, things that people are aware, but um, are not being able to spend sufficient time and energy and resources and, and brain power on. And that's where we see our, our, our value prop, right? Like, it's kind of like, cybersecurity or, or, or say it's like monitoring servers or privacy issues in databases. These are, these are risks that people always have to take care of. You will get in trouble if things mess up, but right, you always want to work with say someone outside who's, who, who are experts in the field right, to, to handle those issues so that you can focus more on the benefits. Right? And so I, I kind of see a good kind of kind of match between what people are looking for and, and what people want to kind of work on with companies like Robust Intelligence. Thanks, and, and just a quick uh, follow-up. So just for your own, um, so does this, uh, um, just wondering if you'd like to add anything and also um, does your company focus then exclusively on machine learning? I guess a big part of our audience, I would imagine is interested in actually figuring out how to get their organizations to use machine learning more how to transition from uh, simple decision-making systems based on rules or from uh, even human decision-making, um, which could be automated in some way. So do you focus uh, exclusively on machine learning systems or uh, things that are maybe broader than machine learning? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's a good question. So um, I think that uh, to us, there is, um, there's, not, there's not a big distinction between machine learning and rules. Um, it's a, it, you know, it, we sort of 
uh, basically for us, um, machine learning uh, is, or a machine learning system is anything that takes, uh, you know, data as input and, you know, and then returns, uh, returns, let's say a score as output. And whether that's implemented through a fancy, uh, you know, like PyTorch uh, or TensorFlow uh, model, right? Or, or just like a very, you know, simple set of rules, um, somehow like our technology is, is agnostic to that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, so definitely, and, 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 and that is, uh, I think kind of like very important. There are a lot of companies that are using, um, that are using, uh, kind of uh, rules. I think that all the companies that, um, that we're working with are, um, are basically on their journey to, um, trying to automate, um, you know, decisions in a, you know, in a safe way, uh, using, using machine learning or, you know, rule-based systems. Um, and yeah, and, and I, you know, and I very much agree with Kojin so much so that when, you know, when, when, when uh, we presented the survey and, uh, and I was, and I had to sort of like ask myself, um, you know, what am I more, you know, what's, what's kind of more interesting to me is it the benefits of, you know, machine learning or, or the risks and I'm thinking, and then, you know, so I've kind of got lost in that question a little bit. And, uh, and then I kind of had to remind myself that I'm the CEO of Robust Intelligence. And of course I have to like choose that, you know, risks. So maybe uh, you know that eighteen percent is is probably biased by by cogen. I mean, but yeah, I think I think it is very easy, um, you know, to kind of I, I think kind of to be drawn to the to, to the benefits of machine learning, which are immense, right? So um, yeah, so I think uh, I, I think that there's there's definitely kind of like this uh, this interesting balance there. Got it. Yeah, I think you also mentioned something really interesting about how data scientists in a company might actually introduce bugs. Um, into the system, and that third-party software is necessary to sort of check the, you know, the work of internal employees. So that's something I hope we can come back to um, a little bit later. But now, Georgina, just wondering if you have any any follow-ups, any other questions? Yeah. So actually, related to that question, I was going to ask you, Yaron, um, what what do you consider the boundaries uh, conditions of your system? So, in which setups does your product work really well, and maybe in what setups does it work less well? Um, our product works across all, uh, across all sorts now. Um, Obviously. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that is, um, you know, that, that, that is, that is really interesting. And, you know, these are things that we're, you know, like, um, you know, kind of like thinking about every day. Um, I, so first off, um, we um, um, kind of like, we're, we're constrained uh in, in in ways like where you know we can't um um you know we'll kind of like when, when we're thinking about like machine learning there are so many tasks in machine learning right uh there are so many uh you know there's uh you know so there there's kind of like doing things like you know making kind of uh simple predictions there there's doing kind of regressions there are multi-class predictions right uh there are rankings you know, there are problems for ranking there. And then there, there are different domains. There are, there are domains of images there. Are, then there are domains like for, for speech recognition, there are domains for, you know, financial language processing, right? So um, for us as a company, we're sort of like, you know, um, looking at all this and, and somewhere we have to focus, right? Somehow we have to focus and we have to like figure out like, you know, um, you know, what are the kind of, what are the core what are the core applications? What are the core data types that you know that we need to you know kind of to work with? So I think that that um, that very much kind of like defines uh, the boundary conditions of what we do. Um, so you know, um, kind of um, we we focus on you know, for example, like we we made a conscious decision in, in the company to um, I think we made kind of like two important conscientious decisions. Um, the first one is realizing that we have to focus, we decided to focus, for example, on tabular data, right? So this is, these are kind of like data sets that, um, you know, that, that can basically appear as tables, right? So this is where you have kind of like maybe somebody's, you can have like kind of, uh, you know, insurance companies or, you know, financial companies would have this kind of information, right? Where maybe you have like one column that, you know, describes maybe like the gender of the person, maybe another column describing the zip code and, you know, things like that, right? And this is different from say images, right? Where in images, right, it's what we call it kind of like unstructured data, right? Where basically um, we have, um, we have a, set, a set of pixels that we're learning from. So um, the principles are, you know, what we do are kind of uh, 
you know, translate across, you know, tabular images, but we had to decide in the company of where we're focusing. And um, we decided that we're going to focus on tabular because um, basically what we've seen is we've seen that the, um, the vast majority of companies who are building kind of their AI infrastructure, they're highly focused on, you know, tabular. So we started from that. And then now we are, uh, and now we're basically putting the first systems in production for tasks in, you know, natural language processing and also tasks in, um, uh, for images. Okay. Um, but the second kind of decision that we've made, um, and this is to kind of like deal with um, the vast number of different applications, right, that we have uh, with, uh, with machine learning, right? So for example, like, you know, now we're working with a company that does natural language processing and, you know, they have over a hundred languages, you know, that they need, uh, you know, that, that, they, that they need uh, kind of like to test. And, um, and when you sort of like thinking about a challenge like that, well, you know, at the company, you know, probably at best we speak like five languages, uh, maybe, uh, you know, and you know, so we're not in five like languages. Sort. So um, the, the conscientious decision that we had to make in the company is basically how do we build our software in a way that's modular um, and programmatic, you know, basically programmatic so that um, basically even if we don't have domain expertise in, you know, in a certain task of artificial intelligence or a certain data type, then we're basically um, able to provide companies building blocks so that they can almost like automatically create um, their own infrastructure, their own tests in a matter of like, you know, literally days, um, you know, from kind of like everything that we've done, right? So those are kind of like, I think, I think those are two strong kind of like boundary decisions that we have in the company. What sort of data types are, are, are we working on and what sort of applications? How, and then how do we, and then how do we kind of set the infrastructure of the company, you know, right so that we're managing to focus and kind of like still get as much of the kind of like the integral, right, of uh, kind of uh, customers as we can. Thanks very much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And related to this, Kojin, uh, maybe you can tell me, so what I'm hearing from Yaron is you've decided to focus on certain types of applications. So how would you, how does your product, you know, differ across industries, for example? Yeah, um, so when we actually think about uh, market segments and, and which types of companies to say uh, sell and, and market our products to, um, we actually um, segment them less by industries, uh, but more by the technical and AI maturity uh, that they have. Um, and so for example, right, um, there are uh, companies in finance and insurance that are obviously working on very different problems, but uh, when it comes to the machine learning challenges they face, um, some of those companies have a lot of things in common, um, and they're more oftentimes the, the ones that um, are, are more technically advanced. Um, and so actually, um, we see kind of more similarities and differences uh, across different industry in terms of like the pain points that they have. And, and we try to also uh, like segment the companies that have, for example, you know, started building uh, machine learning models or started utilizing data, but are, for example, struggling to uh, put them out in production or struggling to uh, keep track of what kind of data is coming in or struggling to track the behaviors and, and the hundreds of models that they have uh, across their team. So uh, yeah, I think we tend to focus on these similarities that, that these uh, different companies have in, in different industries. Okay. If, if you don't mind if I jump in a little bit, Kojin, if I can ask you, could you give a, a, a very explicit example, if possible, of a particular industry where you've deployed this, how that looks exactly? Maybe the most interesting case that you've come across so far. Yeah, um, certainly. So for example, we are working with um, a Fortune 500 uh, financial institution, and, and uh, this is technology company, and they're basically um, having this um, like many, many uh, fraud detection machine learning models. And there are several issues that, that, that happen here with fraud detection models. One is uh, just generally around 
uh, the performance of machine learning models. And you know, fraud is a domain where uh, you have like 0.01% or 0.1% that's really fraud. And it boils down to really thinking about capturing like the corner cases and, and thinking about the sensitivity of the model to various uh, changes in the inputs. And the second part that's also tricky about fraud is uh, the fraudsters will react to the new set of rules or the new set of uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that you uh, deploy, right? Uh, they're dynamic, they're people. So they try to trick uh, and game the, the new system that's in place. Um, so there's always this um, cat and mouse game that's happening. Um, and so what our platform helps uh, them do is to uh, discover uh, these corner cases and also these uh, anticipate some of these uh, adversarial behaviors that, that can happen um, and try to be ahead of the game, uh, both in terms of uh, kind of, you know, looking at, yeah, the, the machine learning corner cases as well as these predicting these adversarial behaviors. Is it Georgina, easy this, this, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Georgina. Oh, thanks. Uh, so is it easy to see this adversarial behavior? Like, how does that come across in terms of when you're looking at your data? Yeah, so it, it, it's very hard. And, and uh, this is where uh, we exist and, and help them uh, kind of achieve this. Uh, the way we do this is you can kind of think about this uh, analogously to uh, cybersecurity and white hacking. Uh, where, right, in, in cybersecurity, you also do this exercise, uh, which people call red teaming. Um, and red teaming or white hacking, maybe, if, if that might be a familiar term. It's basically this idea of you wear a fraudster's hat or hacker's hat and try to anticipate, if I'm a fraudster, what am I going to do, right? And, and, and so I mess around with the software system, try to find bugs here and there, and, and, and try to patch it before they notice. So we do something like that in principle, uh, obviously with a totally different technology in the case of machine learning. So when we're given uh, the past data and the model that we have, we look at, for example, the decision boundaries of these models and think about if I'm a fraudster, uh, what kind of things that I would uh, change about the data that I'm feeding in uh, in order to uh, fool these models, right? So that's kind of like the activities that we, uh, let the let our product do automatically in order to surface uh, these vulnerabilities uh, in the models. Yeah, Georgina, I was just going to say that uh, it's quite interesting this game theoretic component, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you use a kind of game theory framework, maybe, um, to to vis visualize this. Yeah, so Yaron actually has a has a paper on this uh, that that right studies this from a game theoretic perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. I, I just uh, just to follow up, I think it's interesting. So one, you know, the chance of fraud is 0 0.001 or so, some low number, let's say. And are you effectively looking at a very specific type of fraud, which is where you have fraudsters coming in who are trying to game the system, which is then yet another percentage fraction of that small percentage fraction. Uh, so, you know, for your own, I guess, just, uh, you know, wondering then is then are, are you then looking at a very, very small percentage fraction of cases? Um, or do you address a, a bigger share of the fraud in some way? Yeah, so I mean, uh, if we're, if, if, we're, if, we're fo if we're focused on the, on the fraud application. Um, so I think, um, taking a step back, right? Um, I think kind of one of the reasons uh, we, we actually, you know, we work with, with a wide variety of companies, but I think kind of, um, I think that there's also good, like kind of like we have a healthy, when we when kind of like looking back on this, we have a healthy representation of fraud groups. And, um, uh, and I think that one of the things that uh, when I sort of reflect on it, like why is it that, um, you know, um, what, what is it that like kind of, uh, Maybe like why did we why why did we start with fraud? Um, then I think that number one is um, um, I think kind of goes back to what Kojin said. Um, when you look at um, just kind of um, when you look at data science teams that are working on fraud, they update their models quite frequently. And the reason that they update their models quite frequently is because you know of this cat and mouse game and the fact that fraudsters are you know very much trying to infer um, the the nature of the algorithms for fraud detection, right? 
uh, in various ways. And, and as a result, you sort of, you find yourself constantly have to, having to sort of like fight fires and, you know, kind of plug in the holes. So um, what, you know, what that means is it means that you're kind of like uh, pretty regularly pushing models into production. And when you're pushing models into production, um, one of the things that you want to kind of like be looking for are kind of like potential adversarial um, uh, kind of uh, loopholes, right? But you also want to make sure that like your, um, your model is not affected by things like capitalization or, you know, like uh, that your model knows how to handle missing features or, you know, all these kinds of things. Because, you know, even though, you know, these things kind of like seem benign, you know, um, fraudsters can and will take advantage of them. I think kind of to me, one of the, one of the funniest stories was like that we discovered that like there's um, um, one group that was doing uh, fraud detection where for them, the vulnerability was capitalization. Um, you know, like, um, uh, capital what, what is capitalization exactly? Yeah. So it's the most banal thing that you can imagine, right? Um, you have country codes, right. As a feature. And if these country codes are capitalized or not capitalized that, um, it turns out that that makes like, um, huge effect right, on the model performance and its ability to catch fraud. So what that means is it means that effectively, if you're a fraudster, um, fraudsters have basically, um, you know, like when they're sending their information uh, to, you know, like kind of, um, they're basically kind of tra sending transactions, right? And they're using what's called emulators. And, um, and as they're using emulators, uh, they, can, uh, they can send the data uh, in various forms, right? So for example, they can send country codes that are not capitalized, uh, right? And then, you know, just by doing, and then by doing that, they can succeed in, in following a system. So, um, you know, sometimes like we read in the press about like all these very sophisticated adversarial attacks where people like develop these algorithms to fool the mere machine learning models and then they can print stickers and put them on stop signs. But, you know, um, fraudsters, you know, if you, if you allow them, they will also, you know, um, just not capitalize country codes, uh, you know, to fool your system. Um, so some, you know, there, there is, there, there, there is that, but then what we also do in the company is we also, in, in the world of fraud, we, we, we do things that are like, um, like I think also like kind of uh, very nuanced and sophisticated. So for example, like we look at um, inconsistencies, we have like kind of these, these, these models for looking at inconsistencies in the data, right? Um, you know, is like, are, are there, um, are there uh, kind of like features that are statistically inconsistent, right? And that, that's, that's usually kind of a sign for you know, for a bug or, you know, in the case of fraud, that's usually uh, a sign for fraudsters using emulators and somehow like they, they just generated a transaction where there's something inconsistent about that transaction. So inconsistencies would be like something like, you know, you would have um, like, uh, you know, a transaction where like the, you know, the country code is maybe the, U you know, the US, but the city is, you know, is, um, uh, I don't know, Shanghai. Right. Or, you know, or there's some in, in, in discrepancy between like time zones and things like that. Right. So one of the kind of like the nuanced things that we do in, in, in our checks, right. Uh, our test is like where we, we test for any inconsistencies in the data. And that's kind of, uh, that's a big indicator. Um, so, you know, things like that. And then also kind of, we do like kind of these, these adversary examples where we perturb the data points in a specific way to sort of see whether there's a you know, big effect in the model, things like that. Yeah, that's very interesting. I thought capitalization was some new machine learning concept that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, but it turns maybe. out you just literally mean capitalizing words can mess yes. up an algorithm. Yes, yes. So yes. that's great. But, but, but I'm sure it's also like a fancy term for something else. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, okay, so Georgina, um, do you have any other thoughts, or shall we? Shall I ask a business question, and then we maybe proceed into the questions of the audience? Sure, up to you. Um, Okay, since I'm seeing there's a lot of questions here here in the audience, and we want to make sure we have enough time to address many of them. Um, so while Georgina kind of takes a look at them and decides maybe where we start, uh, I'll ask you one sort of question transitioning now back from the tech into the, the business side of things. Um, I think we touched on, you know, this, this idea of consulting versus product. I think there was a, a question here as well that sort of asks something like, um, you know, are you sort of like a volunteer? So let me let me actually just start start from that question because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so this is by by Horvick. He's asking a question: Is robust intelligence a sort of volunteer model with lots of consultants and data scientists to build a solution for each client? And volunteer, by the way, for those those who may not be familiar, 
I recently IPO'd a very, very big, well-known uh, sort of company in the data science space um, that's been around for, for several years now and it is, uh, did quite well on its IPO. Um, so is, is, is Robust kind of like a, like a palantir with consultants in data science building custom solutions for different clients? Or is it making sort of like a product that people just download off the shelf and then they can apply this product right away? And so how do you think about this? And also how, how do you think about scaling whatever business um, it is that you are particularly running? And I guess uh, let me pose this question to Kojin since you're on answered the previous question. So let's see, what, what do you think, Kojin? Yeah, so the, the short answer is uh, we're uh, much more product focused um, uh, than kind of consulting based. And uh, when we think about currently, for example, the employees that we have, uh, 10 of them uh, are engineers. And so five of them are kind of including uh, founders and, and some non-technical people, uh, non uh, like non-engineers. And all the engineers are heads down uh, building the product. Um, and I think when people think about AI companies, um, I think there are largely like two types. Uh, and, and one is kind of like AI as a service. So build, meaning like you're building AI for, for other companies. Um, and there's the other type, uh, which includes robust intelligence that develops the tools and platforms to help other companies build AI. And I think the TLDR is that for the former, um, there is always this tension between how much do you want to customize the AI as a service for a particular customer versus how general you want to be. But for the latter, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for building a product that is scalable and repeatable. Um, and to kind of elaborate on this for AI as a service, and, and uh, I think Palantir um, does this kind of more with software and, and a little bit with data science, there are also uh, kind of, uh, you know, other companies in specific domains in like computer vision and NLP, uh, they always end up this, with this dilemma where um, they want to uh, build a solution that's applicable to as many, as many companies as possible. But machine learning by nature, uh, as Yaron said, there are so many different tasks. There are so many different like feature engineering and domain expertise that you need to build in. Um, and it's when you think about really delivering uh, customers value uh, by uh, developing AI models, uh, at some point uh, there's some kind of custom work uh, that's involved, which uh, pushes uh, even companies that aspire to be product companies to be a bit more like consultancy. Um, however, um, if you think about uh, building tools to help companies, um, as I said, um, there are more similarities than differences across industries in terms of like the pain points companies face when they develop the models. So uh, the way they collect and manage the data, the, the way they test and validate the models like in like what we do uh, and the way they uh, check the how the model's doing in production. Uh, those are uh, more challenges that are um, solvable in, in, in a general way. And because robust intelligence is more focused on, on the latter, uh, we're more uh, on the, the product focused uh, business model uh, than uh, consulting focused. Yeah. I, I will, um, so I very much agree with everything that Kojin said. Uh, I'll just sort of like give a quick plug, like, and just say that like, um, you know, like um, the, we kind of like um, our product is something that you, you install in, uh, you give your product, you install it in two, you, you basically install it in five minutes, uh, you, and then you run it in two minutes and it just automatically checks your machine learning models, period. Uh, so it's, it's very much like a, um, uh, it's, I, I think it's, a, it, it's, it, 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 it's very, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very product focused. Um, so yeah, so uh, anybody who wants to try it, uh, please uh, contact us. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Georgina, do you see any interesting questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I've seen a more general question here, which is about the links between risks and regulation. So this is by uh, Cyril. How do you imagine the auditing of algorithms by regulators to mitigate the risk involved? So maybe Yaron, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Regulation is um, regulation is is a uh, is a. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that's a very important topic, and um, and you know we're you know kind of like uh, we see regulation on um, 
there are two aspects in which we, we sort of see regulation and compliance. One aspect is um, one aspect is the aspect when we're working with companies, we see the amount of regulation and compliance that is involved with handling data, uh, kind of like having third party being exposed to like uh, you know uh, data and machine learning algorithms. And uh, this goes also kind of which is um, you know which is very thorough, right? So um, what we've quickly learned is we we learned that if we um, there is a very big difference for us if uh, we're working with a company whether we are um, whether we have exposure to their data or whether we do not have exposure to the data. And from robust intelligence terms, like it basically um, it's basically kind of like um, it's it's a matter of like. Uh, six months you know so if we can if, we, if we're ready to start working with the company like today if we kind of like need to have exposure to um basically kind of like to, to their data and their models then that would take us like another could take us another like an additional six months to get through that compliance process versus uh giving a product uh, as we're doing right now where you know somebody just installs you know the software uh on their own machines right and runs and runs it with without robust intelligence having to see the data Right then, uh, then basically it can. This is something that can happen immediately. So one aspect is this uh, this this compliance aspect of handling, uh, you know, like handling data and handling machine learning models that is becoming like um, very real, right? And uh, and I think kind of like it's, you know, it's a uh, it's a very big speed bump, right? Uh, to kind of like doing business. So that's something that uh, companies need to be thinking about. The other aspect of it, and I think this is maybe a little bit more of the focus of the question, is um, is there going to be, you know, is there regulation about, about machine learning models? Um, so right now, um, there are, there are no strong, like other than, you know, kind of privacy, uh, regulations uh, that we're all aware of, uh, on, on data right now, basically, um, there are no regulations on, on usage of machine learning models, which if you think about it is, it's kind of scary, right? You can build a self-driving car, you know, uh, making this decision based off of, you know, machine learning models. There is, and there is no, there are no regulations, there are no practices. There is no mandate that, um, that requires you to test, right, your models and making, making sure that they kind of like pass some like very basic, uh, you know, um, sanity checks, right? Uh, there's, there's no regulation now on usage of, uh, of machine learning models for making loan decisions, right? Uh, you know, kind of making sure that, you know, kind of best using kind of best practices, making sure that you're using uh, kind of like balanced data sets and making sure that you don't have, you know, biases. Um, that regulation does not exist right now. Um, whether that like, I, I think that we and all our customers are highly skeptical that, you know, that even three years from now, that will, that will remain the situation. So we are aware of, um, we are aware of, like at least in the U.S., we're aware of, uh, of Congress making. Um, we're we're aware of processes inside Congress that are basically coming to put in to put regulations in place on um, you know best practices of testing uh, machine learning models, testing AI, and uh, and kind of and written and basically putting some some regulation on this. Yeah, I just saw uh, one of the audience posting a link on today's EU announcement around uh, AI oh. trust and, and uh, so thanks for helping our business. Um, <laughs> and I, I've I also heard of there's one in, in the US if, if people want to look up called I think SR117, which is I think specifically focused on the finance industry. Um, and I think it's been around since 2011. So it's been a while. And, and it, 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 I think it's one of the early, very early examples of um, uh, enforcing financial institutions to make sure that uh, essentially do what exactly what we're trying to do, which is to look at model behaviors in very gra granular ways. Um, and so there are certainly kind of early signs of, of these things uh, that are that are popping up. Um, and to kind of add on to what Yaron said, I, I, I see regulation and kind of technology product-based solutions as, as complementary. Um, and basically, you know, if you think about like, for example, privacy or security, uh, law enforcement alone cannot uh, right, ensure uh, companies to adhere to these principles. 
um, because there's no way to do it. Uh, but at the same time, if it's if there's only product, then uh, right there's no kind of kind of push from the the right the lower bound side to to uh, force companies to uh, move in a certain direction. So I think this is something that uh, needs to go hand in hand. So in that direction, uh, not completely linked to any questions in the poll, what do you see as the next steps uh, for machine learning? So where do you see this going in, in a couple of years? Uh, maybe Kojin? Yeah, um, you mean like kind of after, uh, after kind of um, identifying risks or is that? Yeah, so, so I'm guessing for your company and in general for the machine learning community, what do you see as, as coming next? I see. I think uh, I just see. if I may, if I may jump in as well, I'm also thinking about this like silly slide that I showed at the very beginning with the different, you know, ML kind of waves of people collecting data, then trying to deploy algorithms to get value, and now trying to, you know, protect the value that the algorithms are generating. Um, you know, maybe what's next is the question. And do, do you agree with this overall sort of trajectory? Um, you know, maybe this is still a few years out, so you don't have to think about it yet. But if you have given it some thought. Um, you know, do you yeah. see us now being kind of in the regulation phase where, you know, we're worried about mostly risks and then after that, you know, what will kind of happen in this field? I think um, as, as like kind of the poll suggested, uh, I think people are transitioning from uh, thinking more about, uh, originally thinking more about the benefits of machine learning to also thinking about the risks. And I think this kind of trend is just starting and, and uh, I think for the next uh, 10, 20 years, like this, I, I think will be the, the central theme uh, of the conversation. And um, as more, right, and, and a lot of companies are um, kind of at the start of adopt, adopting the AI technology as well. And so as companies adopt things, right, we work with companies ranging from using AI uh, on one application to like companies that are literally running hundreds or thousands of uh, machine learning models in production. And um, right now it's, it's very rare and people are like, wow, they're so advanced. But in, in five years, you'll see kind of a lot of companies doing that. And, and, and there will be a lot more need, uh, not just for kind of uh, identifying risks in a single model, but say uh, managing and organizing your, your models across your organization. And so um, I think, the short answer is like, I think this, this, this um, issue of risk will persist and I think it will change its form uh, to kind of adopt to like the, the trends in, in how people uh, increasingly adopt uh, these, uh, these AI models in production. Yeah, I, I think maybe just, just adding to that, um, I think kind of a good analogy is, I think that, um, you know, the state of machine learning is maybe like the state where maybe like, um, you know, um, software was, or, you know, the internet was right. Where it's like, uh, maybe like where maybe it was uh, kind of decades ago, right. Where I think that we're kind of now discovering or companies are now discovering machine learning, right. And the power of machine learning. And, uh, and I, I think that there is like, and, and, and the issues of, of, of trust and security are here to stay you know, in machine learning are here to stay with us for like the next you know, like infinitely many years, right? As long as we're, I think that as long as we, we're, we continue this adoption of machine learning, trust, security are gonna, you know, are, are staying, are gonna stay as main things. I think that like the questions are gonna be, you know, more nuanced uh, than, uh, than, than they've been before. Uh, I, I think that there's gonna be, you know, like there's gonna be more convergence and agreement in the same way that like kind of the world is somewhat like, you know, maybe people will argue with me, but the world is somewhat converged on, C and Python as programming languages, right? In the same way we see sort of like the world converging on, you know, machine learning paradigms, right? For kind of like large scale data. And once I think kind of once there's this kind of like stability, right? Um, then the questions do become kind of like more nuanced, right? Like we're not asking ourselves like, okay, what's gonna happen? Like what's gonna be the next trend in, 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 in software after, you know, after we solve security? You know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, for better, for worse, it's, it, you know, uh, that the, the cybersecurity trend is, is here to stay with us. Uh, Georgina, she'll ask uh, one more question from the audience. Um, one more and then we'll have to wrap up. Yes. 
So perhaps this one by, by Sven, since it got a good number of upvotes. And uh, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just go ahead here. So Sven, Sven is using OCR, I guess, optical character recognition combined with AI in his company. And uh, you know, they need human intervention to check whether the data that was captured is correctly. So they have this kind of refinement process where humans actually need to review. How do you sort of, do you have this kind of human in the loop processes at your company um, in any capacity? Um, at, at our company, we, we don't, but we help a lot of companies that do have human in the loop process. Um, and I can kind of answer to this, this question by saying that like, we, our goal is to not replace or eliminate the, the humans in the loop. I think this is something that's needed uh, in order mm -hmm. to label uh, certain uh, types of data, but we certainly help identify the right, for example, set of uh, data to label and we, we help companies make that process efficient. So for example, right now, maybe you might be say randomly sampling uh, data to additionally label, but for example, within the suite of tests that we run against machine learning models, we have one test that identifies a certain cluster of data uh, that the model is underperforming on. And what uh, companies can do uh, using this test result is then to focus their human in the loop process on those specific uh, categories of data, uh, which can like save costs and time and, and, and it can uh, kind of improve the, the efficiency and, and the gains that you can have from, from additional data. Got it. So more concretely, suppose that a bank has, you know, checks that you have to take a photo to identify what's written in the check. Um, some of these cases are leading to errors. So when uh, the machine learning model tries to analyze these cases, you find that there's a certain category, a certain type of checks, a certain type of way of writing in the checks that leads to more errors. And that way you can guide, you know, what should the humans actually be looking at more? They should maybe be looking at labeling data with checks of this particular category more so than just randomly labeling data from different checks as to what is the right sort of number on the check. Um, and this exactly way they right. either work more efficiently, if I understood correctly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and also just, just adding to that, like um, another great example is we talked about inconsistencies and in fraud, finding inconsistencies in data. So actually um, some of the companies that we work with actually employ armies of people who are tasked with um, finding uh, these inconsistencies because that is you know, kind of like by nature, like kind of a, a, a task that's like the humans are very good at, like kind of finding, you know, these irregularities in the data. So one of the things that, you know, kind of like we do is, uh, you know, by using kind of our product, we automatically find uh, surface these inconsistencies just from kind of like finding statistical correlations, right? And that helps humans in the loop to sort of focus more on, um, you know, kind of like to, you know, to kind of gather attention on, on, on what these and, and what are statistical inconsistencies that the machine finds and then they can kind of do their job on it. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, Georgina, any, any other thoughts or? Well, I think we need to wrap up now, but that was- Yes, I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Kojin Yaron for joining us. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience for, for joining this webinar. Remember uh, capitalization, you know, if you have uh, anything in your models and your data, capitalization can actually be a very important factor that um, can be exploited by fraudsters, just capitalizing certain words versus not others. But of course, beyond that, also robust intelligence, um, as Yaron and Kojin were describing, uh, seems to address quite a wide range of, of issues related to the deployment of machine learning models and making sure that, you know, models that are um, you know, in developing as a proof of concept that they can actually go into production, be applied to large scale data sets and not sort of collapse, not mess up in many different ways by first going through this robust intelligence layer to make sure, you know, that these errors aren't, aren't, aren't happening. Um, so on that, thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to see you in future, future webinars, future seminars. Thank you, you again. Much.